Hey guys, this is Alex, or as we call him here in the basement, self-identified listener number three. <laughs> and what's funny is, when I'm not stacking Benjamins, I'm usually counting gold in my Los Angeles bunker, maybe buying a new van for the missus. Sometimes I call my significant other and tell them to stop tracking the time it takes to manage our rental empire, such as in 15-minute increments, so that I can jet set from Hawaii to the middle U.S. on a budget airliner to get one hell of a deal on a new car to drive back to Vegas just in time to tell my best friend about the trip to Vietnam that my family and I went on. Did I mention I went to Vietnam? <laughs> what? Doug, Doug, get out of here. You're ruining the intro. Gotta go. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. <laughs> I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and according to my crazy holiday calendar, it's National Hairball Awareness Day. I'm not sure why flags aren't at half-staff for that one, but we're saluting this valuable and important holiday by welcoming to the show from her first 100K, Tori Dunlop. Plus, from this podcast, OG, and from LenPenzo.com, it's Tiger Woods. (laughs) He's just busy cleaning out all the Vegas people who bet against him last week. It's just Len Penzo. Plus, in our Friday FinTech segment, how about a board game that teaches you how to understand financial statements? I know, pinch yourself, right? Can it get any better than that? Today, to show off the new Easy Profits game, we welcome Jared Sessler. And now, the guy leading this band of merry men and women, Joe Saul Sihai. That's me. We steal financial advice from the rich. We hand it to the rest of us. Hey there, everybody. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. Happy Friday to you. And do we have a crazy band of people here with us today? And starting across the card table from me, it's my good buddy, OG, back for another Friday. Fry yay. Fry fry, hell yay. Yeah. You got big plans this weekend besides hanging out with us for the next hour? Uh, Yeah. As soon as that gets done, I will actually move on to a weekend. So, yes, sure, big plans, always. So you're like, get with it, Skippy, come on. (laughs) Anytime you're ready to end this. I am the last barrier between you and the weekend. Speaking of barriers, the guy who's in a barrier deep below, somewhere below Los Angeles. That's nice work. It's Thank you. Ninja, hashtag ninja. It's uh, my good buddy, Len Penzo. Yep, I just painted all four walls of the bunker. Uh, Time for a little change of color. Uh, we're going from dark to light. So dark on dark wasn't working too good. It was really hard to see down there. So we, we're all white now. A little more reflective. <laughs> yeah, I figured that out. Took a while, OG. You should just go with mirrors, I think. You know, makes Ooh, a place like look a bigger. Like a fun house? Well, not that many. You have, have the, the ones that like, are like really, you get really skinny in one and really fat in the other. And you're like, I don't know what to do with my diet. All my mirrors right now make me look fat. So I probably need, I need to fix those. No, it's not the mirrors that do that. <laughs> <laughs> your eating habits easy 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 we need to keep the guy's ego intact so he keeps podcasting and wondering what she's doing here from her first hundred thousand we're so happy on my dad shortwave in seattle washington it's our good friend tori dunlop i'm so happy to be here i need some skinny mirrors in my house that would be very convenient it, i would like that a lot well well they they those things just fly off the shelves I mean, <laughs> What is it in dressing rooms where they tilt it back to make you look like five to 10 pounds later? I was reading about that just last week. How brighter all the, lights. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I and never, then now they start putting little tags in the corner of women's dressing rooms that are like, you are beautiful. And I'm like, thank you. You're just trying to sell me clothes. Hey, ho- slow down, Tori. I'm trying to write all these down. What, what, was, that <laughs> other, what was the angle? Yeah. Oh, You're an engineer. You should degree, know this. 42 degree angle. <laughs> Well, I am excited you're here. As you know, we've talked about you on uh, our sister show on Muddy in the Morning, but let's talk about you here. You're uh, very close to saving $100,000 by the time you're what age? 25. So the deal I've made with myself is as long as I do it the day before I turn 26, it still counts. So yeah, I'm the founder of Her First 100K. So I'm trying to get every woman out there, Her First 100K, whatever that looks like for them. So yeah, for me, it's it's saving 100K before I turn 26, so at the age of 25. And the amazing part, OG, she started three weeks ago. 
grinding really hard. <laughs> Isn't that, is that incredible? <laughs> they call it side hustle, selling funhouse mirrors. Side hustle. Yeah, yep. to the gap. Uh, no, seriously, when did you start saving? Because you started at a wee young age. Well, I started my first business when I was nine years old. So I owned vending machines. So it's the kind where you put a quarter in, you get a handful of candy out, those kind of vending machines. And uh, awesome. that was an awesome, awesome gift my parents gave me. And so I had that business for about 10 years and sold it to a 10 year old who also happens to be named Tori. Uh, so she's now doing the same thing with her Didn't parents. Didn't have to change any of the paperwork. That's what, literally, that's it was great. Um, so that was really fantastic. More just the learning how to run a business, how to pitch myself, profit and loss margins. Uh, I was writing my first check when I was nine years old. So it was it was a great learning experience. But yeah, I mean, I really started saving when I got my first quote unquote big girl job. So I was 21. That's incredible. So your financial statement looking pretty healthy. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. I mean, and there was a lot of privilege to that, too, that I'm happy to acknowledge. And I was able to graduate without student loan debt, which I know for a lot of young Americans, but it's just not the reality. So I worked really hard collaboratively with my parents to make sure that financially we could do that. They didn't just like write me a check, hand it to me for $50,000, but um, they did help me through that financially. So that's a privilege I like to acknowledge where I wouldn't be where I am if that hadn't happened. But I also wouldn't be where I am if I didn't start investing at 21 and didn't, you know, save a good chunk of my income and didn't side hustle. So there was a lot of things that went into it, but I'm just really excited that I'm able to grow and start a community of women talking about money and, and able to grow their financial futures too. Well, I'm excited that you're here with us. And by the way, if you want your personal health to look as healthy as Tori's financial health looks, you might want to look at MetPro. Man, thanks to MetPro for supporting Stacky Benjamins for a complimentary metabolic profiling assessment and a 30 minute consultation with the MetPro expert. Head to metpro.co, not metpro.com. That's something else. Metpro.co slash SB. Thanks also to Experian Boost for supporting Stacky Benjamins. This is exciting. Experian Boost could potentially help you establish or increase your access to credit. How would you like to get that credit score? higher or actually get your credit score established boost your fico score instantly and for free boost is only available at experian.com slash sb that's a little s little b they tell me by the way can't capitalize them experian.com slash little sb we got a great show we got len penzo again from the bunker live this time the all white painted bunker we've got og across the card table from me we have the amazing tori dunlop here so let's get this party started hello darlings and now it's time for your favorite part of the show our stacking benjamin's headlines our headline today comes to us from market watch this is written by katie hill the number one thing people with fat and not PHAT, but FAT savings accounts scrip on that you likely don't. I found this interesting, Lem. We'll start with you. What was the one big thing? Let's just cut to the chase with this piece that they found that people with fat savings accounts scrimp on that other people don't. Well, we'll get right down to it. It's housing, believe it or not. Uh, housing expenses they found a 9% delta in total housing costs between what they call super savers and non-super savers. And I didn't quite catch what the super savers was, just people who are able to save a lot more than the people who aren't super savers. And uh, that is quite a bit, 9% difference. That's between, by the way, the general house uh, cost of the house and the essential homeowner expenses. So those two together, it looks like the budget for super savers is 30% and it is, uh, uh, what? 44%. Yeah. 44. That's every, that's, that combines the two. So the 9% is just the housing. And I believe that is just mortgage or rent. And, uh, I, I don't know if they include property taxes under, you know, in, with the mortgage or not. Oh, I'm but, sure they, I'm sure they'd have to, that would have to yeah. be part of that. Does that surprise you? No, not at all. I mean, that's the easiest, you know, that's, that's what I tell a lot of people. They, they say they're struggling. One of the, the biggest chunks of savings you can do is, is your cost of living in housing. Sometimes it necessitates a change of venue of where you live, moving to a lower cost of living place. I have a, a cousin who actually did that, moved from, was having trouble making ends meet here in Southern California, which is extremely, extremely expensive. And uh, he moved to Mississippi and the guy's living like a king now. So it was yeah. the best thing he's ever done. He's been there for many years now. And, uh, but it, it made all the difference in the world for him. 
I found that even between Detroit, which isn't known as a high rent district, and Texarkana. I mean, moving to Texarkana was amazing, the amount of money we could save on housing. Speaking of housing and high rent districts, Tori, you're in a high rent area in Seattle. Oh, my goodness. My son's there. And uh, that is not cheap. How do you keep your housing costs in check? So that's actually one of the things that I've decided I will splurge on. I do this with clients and I I have them assign their three money priorities, the three things they're willing to spend money on, their discretionary income. So for me, it's travel, it's food out, and it's living alone in Seattle. I like running around naked and leaving clothes in the or clothes out and dishes in the sink better than I like living with a roommate. So for me, I have strategically decided that that is a priority for me. But I mean, Seattle is so expensive. It's very, very hard to to manage your financial life when you live in a high cost of living area. So I think not only moving might be a great opportunity, but even moving neighborhoods, like there's some neighborhoods in Seattle that are cheaper than others. I live in a cheaper neighborhood in Seattle that for me is, is more fitting with my lifestyle because it's a cheaper and B it's quieter. Like it's much, it's not like the in place to be. And so I pay less in rent. And then I have a lot of friends who do the roommate thing. So they get a house and every person rents out a room in the house. So you don't necessarily have to move across the country. You can move neighborhoods. You can get a roommate. There's there's certain situations where, you know, you can still lower the cost of housing without making this huge sacrifice. For you personally, though, was that the trade off to live alone to move to a lower rent district? Yeah, that was definitely part of it is my commute slightly longer. It's slightly more complicated, but I love it up there and I love living alone. Yeah. And so that was the trade off is, OK, I'm going to pay a little bit more money, but I'm still going to make sure that I can afford it. It's less than 30 percent of my income and my, my take home pay and that sort of thing. Yet, OG, you see people all the time, I think, who are busy saving money on all these little things which never add up. It's definitely a common theme across almost all uh, financially successful people is that they didn't they didn't continually price themselves into another real estate deal. Most notably, you know, Robert Kiyosaki's got his whole rich dad, poor dad thing about how uh, a lot of times people will continue to go, Hey, I got a pay raise. Now I can move to a better school district. I got another pay raise. I can move to another school district. And if you can keep your housing expenses, even if they're elevated early flat, that helps tremendously as time goes on, as your income continues to grow. We noticed this when we moved, you're talking about moving from, Michigan to Texarkana. We moved from Michigan to Dallas. I still marvel at this. Our rent expense was more than our house payment was, but it was easier to do because there was nothing else that we had to do. We didn't also have a simultaneously higher heating and cooling bill and landscaping to take care of and uh, just regular home maintenance of trips to Home Depot every so often, So you're saying, which I found was really interesting. You're saying that your housing expense was a little more, but the this essential homeowner expenses then was zero. So yeah. because of that, the combination of the two, you were able to wipe out that. It's true. It was a lot more, or I should say it was a lot easier on the family budget and a lot less stressful because there's something about renting versus buying where once you have the thing, now you are obligated to pay for it for the next 30 years versus if you rent an apartment and you go, this place sucks, I'm going to leave. And you just leave in nine months from now or whatever, you know. And it's funny as time has gone on, how my opinion about this has changed. And even, you know, Mrs. OG and I were talking about how if we keep on the path that we're on, you know, we'll pay the house off in eight years. And she's like, oh, eight years is so long. It's so long from now. And I said, Con- contrasted to 26 more years, the do nothing plan is 26 years of mortgage payments. The let's think about it and do it this way is eight years, which also sucks, but it's better than 26. So it's a big focus of ours. And I know of a lot of people too. But I like this idea of renting. Tori, do you, do you own or rent then? I rent. I was going to buy a house when I was 21. I was a day from closing on a house and it was the best decision I made to not do that because I was just not, I was not ready. And I was also going to, because I could not afford a house in Seattle, I was buying a house in Puyallup, which is a town about an hour away from Seattle Seattle. where my, yeah, where my family lives. And I love my parents, but I would be spending every weekend hanging out with the fam. And I didn't want to do that. Like I wanted to have friends. I would have been commuting. I would have spent an hour and 45 minutes on the train one way 
So, you know, what, three hours, 315 every day to commute. And that's just as, you know, someone in her early twenties, that was not what I wanted to do. I wanted to make friends. I wanted to date. I wanted to go out to dinner and I was going to be able to do that with coworkers and with my community in Seattle instead of like ostracizing myself by moving somewhere else. So it ended up working out for me. And, and to OG's point too, like I would rather rent, especially since I have a busy schedule. I have a nine to five. I have a side hustle. I have all these things going on. I don't want to have to worry when a pipe bursts. Len, let's you and I have the old guy conversation here for a second. <laughs> that dude, that has changed significantly from when you and I were kids. Cause I remember mm-hmm. my, I mean, my parents telling me buy a house. That's a, a great investment. What's changed there. Cause I totally see it the way Tori and OG been talking about. It's not necessarily a great investment anymore. I agree with them too. If I tell my kids to rent, that's what I would tell them to do right now. So, but when we were younger, <laughs> What was different? You know, I don't know. It was almost like you it was expected for you to get a house, you know, as soon as you could. And you had a job. And and uh, I know I lived with my parents for, um, gosh, right out of college, maybe for two years, I think, or yeah, probably a year and a half. And I was paying them rent in quotes. I would pay them, I forget, five hundred dollars a month or something like that. And then they would just save that money for me. And I was saving that for a down payment. And of course, I got a down payment. I bought a house. And of course, that was near the top of the market. And I think I've told this story before many times. I was upside down for the next seven years and it was I was miserable. So but it was kind of just expected. Yeah. I, I don't know. Do you agree, Joe? I, I think that's it just, hey, that's what you did. Well, my first house was the same. I was upside down. But, OG, you, what do you think? I was going to say the thing that is missing from that we were told because you guys can be old guys. I'm closing in on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting there close. But the thing grandma and grandpa told me and basically your parents, but my grandparents. Nice. <laughs> and my great grandparents. Nice. <laughs> her great grandparents. No, but, OG, but the second OG's part of that, got us down on the ground line and Tori just walks up and kicks us. <laughs> yeah, kicks us. Very yeah. nice. How does no, the other side of that bus look? That's that right. great. The, uh, the second half of that is the part that's missing here. So grandma and grandpa or mom and dad said, you should get a good job and buy a house comma, and pay it off. Because the story was about trying to get that security of owning the place you lived in. Because, you know, back in the 30s, before, you know, before all the mortgage reform, house notes were callable. And that was the big thing. That's why grandma and grandpa worked really hard to pay the house off. So it was get that security so you can't get kicked out of your house for rent or get kicked out of your apartment you know, get rent increased out of it, but then also the bank can't come and kick you out. That's what they were worried about. Now, of course, that's not a thing anymore. So we truncated the the message of get a good job, buy a house and pay it off and truncated that into buy a house. And um, And that's all well and good, except just look at the behavior of everybody. It's buy a house, pay a little bit on it, refinance it, buy another house, with just a little bit down, refi it to pay off the credit cards and the student loans. You know what I mean? Like people are in this ever, ever present cycle of not making any progress. But I think part part of that too, as you're talking, OG, I'm also thinking about something else that changed, which is that I don't think there's the expectation you're going to stay with a job for 30 years. So the the chance that you're going to move, I think for Tori is much bigger than for any of us. I mean, and not that you have an expectation that you're going to move on from your current work, probably like what you do, you know, like the company you're with all that stuff. But, but does anybody work for the same company for 30 years anymore? Well, and I think socially too, there's a whole other conversation around people married sooner. So if you went to college, you would graduate college and you'd pretty much get married right out of college if you went to school. And so, uh, you know, you quote unquote settle down with your partner in this one place. And then you probably started having kids if you did not too long after that. I'm 24. My parents were married at 24. I'm I like marriage. Oh my gosh. Like that is not on my radar. I do have friends who are married. I actually have friends who are having kids, which is so alarming. But I, I would say, you know, statistically the average age of marriage is I think like 27, 29, it might even be in their thir- early thirties. So you're settling down later. So I think people are waiting to buy houses later as well. Len's kids still find it uh, alarming that he has kids by the way. <laughs> <laughs> You're right though about the marriage. I mean, my parents got married. My mom was 18 right. and, yeah. and and you go further back. My grandmother was 14. If you can believe that. Wow. 14 married. Well, how so. many people got married right before a war 
whether right. whether you go back two or three generations to World War One or World War Two, it was a lot of like eighteen, seventeen. I don't know about fourteen. That's a little crazy. <laughs> well, and women didn't have you know the the expectation for women. Yeah. But back then was, you know, you're, yeah. you're married and yeah, you get married your and you job kids. is right. Yeah. Your, your job is to take care of the house, take care of your spouse and take care of your children. So that's a whole other issue, but that I'm sure is playing a part in people waiting to purchase if they're purchasing at all. I want to uh, address two more things. One is some math that uh, when Len and I were talking earlier, we talked about a 9% delta, and then there was 14% between the two numbers. The number we were actually comparing was 23% housing expense for non-super savers and 14% for super savers. By the way, non-super savers on average saving 6%, super savers saving 29%. And by far, these housing costs that we've been talking about the biggest, the biggest difference between the two. But one other thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to housing is that just the sizes in general, I thought found this really interesting. Katie writes, it's important to note there's plenty of room to downsize. New homes built in America today on average have a thousand more square feet than they did in the 1970s and living space per person has doubled. And though you may think you need that space, it's likely you don't. As uh, one person quoted in this piece said, I thought we missed the larger space, but we didn't. In fact, we felt more connected as a family. We have more conversations and more spontaneous interactions. I found that OG when I lived in the apartment above Uncle Jack's garage there for six months. <laughs> right. I mean, even though I don't want to do that again, personally, it's it, it's good. I don't want to do it again. I do think that, you know, Cheryl and I became closer during that time. I'm not going to be able to have any reasonable commentary on this section. <laughs> Because <laughs> I need about another thousand square feet just to be further away from my kids. <laughs> isn't, isn't that? Isn't that? Weird? And I already have a lot of square feetage, <laughs> have, and I need more. Have have their zone and somebody else's zone. But but yeah, you've right. seen it, Len. You've seen houses on the suburbs getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, it's ridiculous, in my opinion. And and remember now, a, re- a bigger house, it's not just you know more money for the mortgage or or even the rent if you're going to rent it, but it's utilities costs, it's maintenance costs that all uh, grows as well. Taxes, so it kind of comes you know, the taxes, insurance, yep. it all compounds. So you know, my square, my house is two thousand square feet. The house before this I had was 850 square feet. And I will say 850 square feet to me is a little small. A little snug. Uh, yeah, it's a little snug. But I, to me, 2,000, even a, a couple hundred feet less would be just fine. I mean, I have friends who have these humongous 3,000 square foot, 3,500 square foot homes, and they have rooms they never go in. It's, and then you, you have know. to furnish those rooms, too, because you have to go make those cute. Yeah. So that's going to cost money, too. That's so right. think about that. Yeah, yeah. And True then, that. And then, and then, and then <laughs> Oh, geez. Like, yeah, I know that game. Yeah, <laughs> sure do. But it's interesting, Tori. Do you, I mean, do you find, do you find people your age attracted to this big house thing or is the small house movement alive just in the financial geek sector where I feel no. all the time, or is it al- alive and well everywhere or maybe just the Pacific think, Northwest? I think it's happening for a variety of different reasons. I think it's happening because uh, the flexibility of being able to pick up and move everywhere or anywhere you know, the, the lower cost of living, I think it's happening for a lot of, a lot of different reasons. But if I'm in Seattle, a lot of my friends are living in the city and none of us could even think of buying a house just because housing costs, I think the average home price in Seattle is, it's like $750,000 or something absolutely crazy. And so none of us are, are even, that's not even a remotely on our radar. So thinking about having a big house, we're just lucky if we get a big apartment. (laughs) (laughs) And before we ask for your takeaways, I think one big takeaway that we have when it comes to choices, I mean, it always gives you better choices when you have a higher credit score. I agree that you don't want to have to use credit, but having the flexibility and the confidence to know that you have it, the question is, why does it seem so hard to raise your score? Well, now it won't be. Thanks to Experian, they've launched Experian Boost, a brand new way to instantly, instantly, I like that word. Increase your credit scores for free. Higher credit score can help you establish and get access to the credit and preferred rates when you need them. Experience on a mission to help boost America's credit score, which will help millions of people across the country build and get better access to credit. People across America have already raised their credit scores with Experian Boost, and you should too. For the first time ever, paying your utility and cell phone bills 
can instantly improve your credit score. Experian Boost works by giving you credit for the bills you're already paying through your bank account, like your water, your gas, your electric, your cable, your cell phone. Here's how it works. It gives you credit for all of those bills. So if you pay those through a checking or savings account, you can instantly raise your credit scores. We've been talking about this for some time, about the fact that that's been much needed. It used to take months to see your credit score rise just a point or two. Well, with Boost, you can raise your credit score instantly. Here's the kicker, guys. It's free to use, and it's only available from Experian. This is the first time a credit bureau is letting customers submit utility and telecom payments to be factored in their credit file, and only Experian is doing this. Most people who Boost increase their scores by more than 10 points. And by the way, it's only positive payments that are factored to their credit file. If there's that rare situation where your credit actually goes down, you can disconnect boost and your credit score goes back up to where it was. So there's no downside. As you know, guys, higher credit scores, lower interest rate on your mortgage, lower interest rates on loans, even employers, you know, all that talk about employers starting to look at credit scores, credit scores, pretty important. I can't believe it's taken uh, a credit bureau so long to do this. So thanks to Experian, Experian Boost can potentially help you establish or increase your access to credit. Boost your FICO score instantly for free. Boost is only available at Experian.com slash SB. That's little s, little b. They tell me you can't capitalize them. That's E-X-P-E-R-I-A-N dot com slash S-B. Let's put a cap on this. Uh, Len, takeaways from this piece? Where you live and the, the housing that you live in is extremely important, and it's your best opportunity to cut costs. Yeah, OG? Yeah, I would echo that and just say the anecdotally, the single greatest determinant to longer-term success that I've seen is people who keep their housing costs low. Yeah, well, and take care of their, to, to your point earlier, I think taking care of your debt and retirement too. Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, it all it all just... Yeah. Like Len said, it all snowballs. Yeah. And Tori, as our guest, you got the last word. We hear too much advice from the personal finance community on little wins, on cutting back coffee, cutting back all these things that actually bring you joy in life, and not enough about the actual impact that big wins can have, lowering your housing costs, negotiating your pay, investing, those sorts of things. And those are the things that are really building wealth and transforming your financial life, not the Starbucks for $4. Usually at this point in the show, we have a Friday FinTech segment, but today I am absolutely thrilled because instead we are going to talk board games. For those of you who knew the show, you have no idea just how excited this makes me. Anything that talks about money and makes it easier for people to understand money is great by me, which means that even before I met him, Jared Sessler was a friend of mine. His new game coming to market is called the Easy Profit Game. And if you're somebody that ever wanted to understand all of those financial statements that are out there, this game is designed specifically to make those spreadsheets fun and interesting. Andy Hill from Marriage, Kids and Money, uh, who lives right around the corner from me, actually came over to my house and he and I gave this thing a whirl. And afterwards, I said, Jared, we got to have you on the show and talk about it. So here he is coming down to the basement the man responsible for the easy profit game, Jared Sessler. And coming down the stairs to the basement, it's our new friend, Jared Sessler. How are you, man? Good. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me in. Well, anytime somebody's developing a new board game, are you kidding me? Like I I can hear the eye rolls of half of our audience right now going, Oh, Joe found another, another board game geek. Another groupie. That's right. Well, well, let's talk about this because your game is a lot different than any that I played. When you decided to make Easy Profits the board game, tell me about the genesis. Were you bored and decided, you know what, we need a better way to explain spreadsheets? Yeah, well, the the interesting thing about it is is that I grew up with most everybody around me calling me weird the whole time I was a kid. And I would go home and my mom would tell me, oh, Jared, you're not weird. You're just different which never made me feel any better because then I would walk away thinking, well, wait a second, what, what's, what's different? What, how is that any different than being weird? And so 
the idea that I came up with a game that is different doesn't surprise me and probably doesn't surprise anybody that knows me. But where did it, where did it come from? Because my understanding is, is that you run a company and maybe it's mm-hmm. hard to get into the company's financials, or maybe you're sitting with your accountant one day going, I need to know how this works better. Tell me the genesis. Yeah. The truth is, is that I like to say I made it for other people, but the truth is I made it for myself because even though I'm an engineer, mechanical manufacturing engineer, I started my own company about 20 years ago. I really didn't have a grasp on finance, which sounds crazy, right? Because what's the number one class that engineers take? We take a bunch of math classes, right? So you'd think, oh, well, business finance should be a snap for an engineer. Well, it's not. And it wasn't natural. And I didn't understand all the terminology and the forms and what they did for you and all that kind of stuff. And so I eventually figured that out. But then I I looked back on that period and I was like, this is way too complicated. There's way too much industry jargon. There's all this confusion. And I think people could be way more successful at running their business if we could make this fun. And so that's where my idea to create the game. And I'm a franchisor. So we have franchisees all over the country. And I thought, you know, let's create this game for our franchisees and see if uh, if we can help them to understand their finances and their business better. We did. They loved it. And it sort of blossomed from there. So it's it started off with your franchisees. Did you first create just a bunch of sheets? I mean, tell me how long it took to develop this game. Because basically the genesis of it, guys, because I have to tell everybody, I guess, I'll tell everybody, uh, Andy Hill from Marriage, Kids, and Money. Andy lives half a mile up the road from me. He came over. Jared actually sent us a pizza Surprised the hell out of us, by the way. Cheryl had no idea what was going on when the when the pizza guy knocked. <laughs> I tried to send beer too, but they wouldn't deliver it. So. <laughs> that would have been even better. But the pizza was awesome. But we sat, we played it, we kept sending you notes because we wanted to get a grip on what it was all about. But basically, you run this company for a year. One side is franchise. If you're a franchisee, one side non-franchisee. How long did it take to develop the game? Well, we actually started the first concept of it It was very simple. It wasn't a fancy printed piece or anything like that. I mean, it was decent, right? We we printed them out, but it wasn't production quality. And we did that for our franchisees. And that was probably close to five years ago that we first produced it. And it was actually much simpler then. It was a single board game. You know, it had some cards to it, some different pieces. Since then, we've expanded it. We've rebranded it, make it look really cool. We've got an amazing Rufus, the icon. I mean, you know, we've got all this fun stuff that we've sort of made it more fun, more interesting. We've also added a website so you can, you know, the website's sort of interactive with play as you guys experienced when you were playing it. And then we've gone through different iterations over the last uh, few years where I've had time to work on it or I took time to work on it, pulled some people together to play it, try it, take notes, go back to the drawing boards, make changes, make it better. Uh, you know, so it's been it's been a work in progress for several years. Explain to me how the game plays. Explain to everybody out there how it plays. So it's really fun. As you mentioned, you're playing basically a year in business as you go. And you start with determining what your company name is. You may play by yourself with some opponents that are also playing the game. Or you might play in teams of ideally two or three people. But you could even have, you know, five or six or ten people on a team if you wanted to. So you figure out what your company name is. You figure out where you're located. There's some strategy in that that goes along with the game and some dice and kind of figuring out where you're located, what your economics are with your location. If you're located in one spot, you might make more money in business than another. And but your expenses are also going to be tied to that. And then you start to play through months. So a round in the game is a month in business. And so you play through that month. You document your results. You draw cards, bad things happen, good things happen, you get sales, you get, you know, expenses, different things happen, you document all that, you run through a month, you run through another month, you check with the other players that are around you to kind of see what we call the economic health, how is the region doing, and then you just continue doing that with an eye towards the bottom line. How much are you making every month, and how are you doing as compared to the other teams that you're playing against? Andy and I played on the same team. We didn't play against another team. So we ran it more as a business simulation. We were doing very well. We owned a pool company in Houston 
which is a great place on a pool company. I mean, that's fantastic. The first couple months went really well. And by the way, Andy had some charts where he was documenting things as our CEO. I was the CFO. And so I was documenting other charts and it was cool because we were passing numbers back and forth to each other. And it was basically, it was a great, from my perspective, it was a great way to learn about how to read a financial statement where different things go. And so we looked at our expenses uh, we did the fairly simple math to fill out the sheets. We then talked about where we were, but a couple months in our owner, big jerk, we had a down month and we got this, this, it's almost like chance cards in, in uh, monopoly. You turn yeah. over this card and, and our owner said he wanted a bunch of his money out and we just had a horrible month. And he ended up sending the, our owner, I, I say he, I assume it was a he, but it could have been a she. <laughs> our owner though, really sent the company into a tailspin because from that month on the next three months, we really struggled before we found our, found our ground again. It developed though, Jared, this interesting discussion around, you know, business tactics and like uh, looking at these different numbers. I'm not the only person who said that this game is as much a discussion piece as it is a quote game. It is. It's, it's almost a bit of trickery if I were to admit it openly. The truth is, is we took some really complicated, boring, crazy, unlikable spreadsheets and we put them into a game to make it fun. And what happens is by the time you're done playing the game, all the intimidation, all the fear, and all the anxiety that's associated with a normal, some of the industry jargon like P&L or balance sheet or statement of cash flows goes away. It's gone because now you've created them for fun and you can then apply that to other areas of your life. Why we don't teach this stuff and know this stuff as secondhand when we're a capitalist country and you know, we're constantly trying to find avenues for, you know, money making avenues. Why, why we don't teach better management of those resources is beyond me. But um, that's what we do with the game. It's a fun way to learn some really relevant and viable stuff that you can use in every area of your life. Now you've got a Kickstarter coming up. Tell us about the game. What do people get with it? And uh, how much do you think it's going to, to run on the Kickstarter? Uh, I think it's going to be around 40 or $50 on the Kickstarter, which is less than what, what it'll go for retail, obviously. Uh, the reason that we wanted to do a Kickstarter is because we really wanted the thing to get a big launch. Okay, It costs thousands of dollars to get these things produced. And we just thought, you know, what a better way to do that than to sell a few thousand of them right out of the gate. The box is a really, really cool game box, very typical to what you might see with a lot of other modern day game boxes. It'll have enough supplies in it to play the game quite a few times. It comes with, you know, obviously everything you need outside of internet access. Our game is very contingent on being able to connect to our website, easyprofitgame.com. And there's some different things as you, as you guys experienced when you were playing it. The website is also a fun learning resource tool. And there's different videos there for tips on how to take care of, uh, you know, different sections in the game, glossary tips on like you were talking about the chance card. You know, when you get one of those, you can go to the website and learn more about that card and maybe some considerations on do you really want to accept this sales opportunity or not. So it feels to me like it's great value. We've played some of these other financial games that are out there. And I don't know, one in particular, not to be... I won't say anything bad about anybody else's stuff, but we played another one that's pretty prominent with my kids and they were just bored out of their minds. This game, they pick it up and play it when not, when I'm not even around. <laughs> How fun is that? That's yeah. cool. Well, I think for the very least, at the very least, anybody who's interested in diving into individual stocks so that you can read an annual report, uh, anyone who's interested in running a company or knowing about how a company runs, uh, if you're a classroom teacher, it's a layup because it's an easy way, I think, to teach it in a classroom how people, uh, how, for sure. yeah, how it all works. So the website is easyprofitgame.com. And you definitely, as Jared said, want to have that open while you play uh, because it, it makes it really interactive. It's very interactive. Also, I like the way the rules are laid out too. We had a couple of rules questions for Jared while we were while we were playing, and and he just reminded us, "Hey, it's it's all right there, man. It's on the left hand side of your board, right there." It was it was actually way easier than we were making it out to be. I think we saw 
all of the charts, Jared. And I thought, oh boy. And then when you said, no, all the rules are on the left side of the board. I'm like, oh, it was way easier than I thought it was going to be. Uh, the Kickstarter, I guess we just go on Kickstarter in the next few weeks and, and put in Easy Profits game. Yeah, if you just go to the to a browser and search Easy Profit Game, there's probably going to be one of two things comes up, either our website or the Kickstarter. And you can opt in even now for the Kickstarter, even though it's not live. Uh, you'll find a kind of a preliminary page where people can opt in and be able to get information about it when it launches. So that's what I would suggest for now. And then, of course, we're on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. So, And for board game nerds, I'm sure you'll link to the Kickstarter on your board game geek page, I would imagine. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We'll, we'll put it on there and also appreciate anybody who does reviews for board game geeks so we can get some stuff up on there. Jared, thanks a ton for adding to the community when it comes to financial games. We need more, man. We need more. Thanks, good, Joe. More good I appreciate games. it. I'm going back upstairs to get more cookies and milk. Hey there, cat lovers and non-cat lovers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and welcome to the segment you've all been waiting for, my incredible trivia. And in case you've forgotten, it's still Hairball Awareness Day. Might not seem like a big day if you're more of a dog person, but let's empathize with Joe's mom for a second. Every time she sees one of those hairballs in the carpet, she screams, The cat's gonna kill me! I tried telling her that we're always saying this show is a circus anyways, and that's just part of a circus life. Don't believe me? Just take another top-notch famous attraction, for example, Disneyland. Sure, people will say it's an amusement park, but that's just the fancy man's way of saying circus. Disneyland has had plenty of cats living in the park over the years, so I'm sure they've seen their fair share of hairballs. Can you imagine how many cats are living in a place that big? I wonder, and here's your trivia question, just how many cats have taken up residence at Disneyland? I'll have your answer, and hopefully some consolation for Joe's mom, right after this. All right, we explain the complicated rules to this game to Tori backstage. Tori, you got it? Am I allowed to ask follow-up questions? <laughs> What's your follow-up question? <laughs> My follow-up question, how do they know? Are they tracking the cats? Are they like... The, the answer, the answer that I know, because I had to help Doug with this one, was yes, they do track the cats. Of they, course they do. Yep, they actually, the cats have been neutered and spayed. They work for the company. They have... Two, they get a W-2 tub, tub, every tub, year. Tub, 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 They're collecting all the bonus. Mickey mice that are running around yes. the park so you're that they don't want there. You're talking live cats at the moment. Yes. Live yes. cats right now living at Disneyland. But you are playing on behalf of Paula. Len, Shocker's playing on behalf of Len. OG's playing on behalf of himself. OG, what is the score to this shindig now that uh, Len won last week? Apparently last week, Len, we got the score wrong. Uh, the present score is six to five to three. Meaning? That has been verified by Ernst & Young. <laughs> And by PricewaterhouseCoopers. Three for Paula, a.k.a. Yes. Tori. Uh, five for Len. And OG's in first with six, which means Still in the lead. Tori, on behalf of Paula, gets to decide first. Are you going to guess first in the middle or last? I'm going last. Oh, wow. That's weird. Not her first rodeo. Mr. Penzo, in the middle or first? I'm going to go hmm, middle. <laughs> <laughs> I There's almost thought power to going in. first because you can anchor everyone else's <laughs> guess because everyone else has an idea right now. That's and then true. I'm going to say my number and it's going to totally destroy what you were thinking. OG is so. still winning and uh, he's uh, gone a first the madness. every time lately. All right. OG. So, so Disneyland, I want to clarify Disneyland, not Disney World. Disneyland in California. California. Or Got include it. California Adventure in this number. So that's it, a good. It is the entire Disneyland property which includes mm -hmm. not just California Venture, but also downtown oh, Disney, the hotels. Parking lots and hotels. Yes. Mm. Not a lot of cats in the hotels, but maybe they have like a cat hotel where they all, do they have to shuttle in like all the other workers? They all park off site. They all, they all have to get on the bus. <laughs> they probably do. <laughs> they got a little briefcase as they, you know, time to go to work, sweetheart. Meow, meow, meow. All right. Number of uh, cats at Disneyland. <laughs> and, by, and, and by cats, that's not some strange euphemism either. We are talking about cats. Yes. Felines. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Okay. I assume that there's probably, you think big cats, you think like coyotes and bobcats, and they cover some pretty good territory taking care of the bunnies in my neighborhood. So there's probably bunnies and mice they have to take care of there. I'm going to say presently there are 4,917 cats living on Disneyland property. 4,917 cats. Mr. Penzo. That's interesting. Let's see. I would tackle this by saying, well, how big is the, the property? How many acres is the property? And frankly, I don't know. So I'm going to guess that that park is probably at least five. Oh, God, no. It's more than <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I'll bet you that. At least park, a third of an acre. At least that a third. park has got to be. It's super tiny compared to Disney World. Yeah, but it's still it pretty is. big. It is pretty big, though. I, I, I don't know. I, I was going to say 100 acres. And let's say how many cats per acre? Uh, 40, 49.17. No, I don't think so. I, I think you're, I think you're way off base. OG. I think you're way off base. I'm going to say per acre. I'm going to say 10 cats per acre, a hundred acres, 1000 cats, 1000 kitties for Len. All right, Tori, 49, 17 from OG a thousand for Len. What are you thinking? My original guess was going to be 65 cats. So I don't think it's going to be 65 anymore. Um, goodness, I've been to Disneyland like six or seven times, and I love it more than certain dead relatives of mine. Like, it's my favorite place on earth. It is the but happiest I, place on earth. It right? is so good. They blow Welcome home. sounds. There are Welcome not sounds. Home. Excuse me. They blow uh, scents down the main street as you're walking through. I don't know if you guys know that. Oh, yeah. I don't they have know like that. a trademark scent. OG does that, but he's, he's <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. It's a crop dusting kind of thing. Yeah. Um, he's he's not kidding around. Um, I'm gonna say 227. 227 for Tori. I'm doing one of these prices right things where I think I'm aiming low in the hopes that I'm closer. Cat. Well, that's funny. Yeah, you could have said one. No, but I think I think it's more than that. And you guys, well, yeah, well, yeah, we we shall see. But you know what? Like any self-respecting podcast, we're going to make you wait. So we'll be back in just a minute. Well, you know, if you're trying to accomplish your goals, it's going to take some energy. And if you're trying to get ahead at work, you're going to have to outlast the competition. And that gets tougher and tougher. And you know what you need? You need to be healthy so that you can stay in the game longer as a leader you understand that it's not just about the number of hours in a day it's about productivity and the same goes for health and wellness it's not fundamentally about what you eat or how to train although those are very important pieces met pro focuses on time management working smarter and getting together a game plan specific to your goals and specific needs. MetPro has a unique and important point of view on what true net worth actually means. Their experience helping CEOs, industry leaders, celebrities, meet unique challenges provides them with remarkable insight for anybody wanting to see a greater return on investment in life. And who doesn't want a greater ROI on your health? MetPro's team of experts guide you through personalized nutrition and fitness strategies and educates you about how your body responds to micro and macro adjustments to your fitness, your nutrition, your daily routine. Their proprietary science, technology, and techniques have helped thousands of executives and business leaders learn how to optimally manage their health and achieve their associated performance goals regardless of how often they travel and how demanding their schedules are. They use this process called metabolic profiling. And I love this because I'm the engineer in me loves working from a data set and then tweaking the data set. And metabolic profiling allows MetPro to get a baseline that helps them see exactly how your body's responding. It gets a very specific set of variables. And then their experts are trained to take those results and translate them into these simple actionable steps that you follow on what you should eat how you should train, what your overall strategy is. You can go back, by the way, and listen to Angela Poli, who was fantastic radio here just a few weeks ago. Go back, uh, hit the search feature on our website. You can go back and hear Angelo's interview with us. For a complimentary 
metabolic profiling assessment, a 30 minute consultation with a met pro expert, go to metpro.co slash SB that's metpro.co not com metpro.co dash SB. All right, OG, nobody's close to you at almost 5,000 kitty cats. I have no idea. They're like literally just was the first number. 4917 Len cool. 1000 cats. I like that. I, I'm confident with that number. You know what's funny is my wife and daughter went to Disneyland just yesterday. Their what? friends work there. They have friends who work there, and so they get in for free. You oh. know, the friends let them get get to bring guests in. Yes. So. How cool is that? Yeah, I should have had them count cats while they were there. If I knew this question, they would have never got to it. it over <laughs> almost damn near five thousand. It would have taken them forever. <laughs> They tried to ride a ride, but they were too busy counting cats. And then uh, how do you know? You count the same tabby twice. It's confusing. And Tori, you got a lot of room there. 227 up to 1,000. You feeling good about that? Yeah, I don't know. We'll see what happens. All right. Well, Doug, Sorry, Paula. <laughs> Doug, what do you think, man? What's the answer? Welcome back, hairballs. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and you're listening to the best part of the show, My Trivia. Before the break, I asked you about Disney's resident cats. Did you know it was actually Walt Disney himself who found the first infestation, uh, um, uh, a residence of feral cats inside of Sleeping Beauty's castle? Now, I'm sure there were a few direct solutions thrown around in the first meetings after the discovery, but after a little imagineering, that's what they call it at Disney, the company decided to bring the cats on as park workers. The felines would manage Disney's rodent problem. Yeah, there was a rodent problem. And the park would manage the colony's population to keep it under control. And as an added bonus, the park put out extra food for the cats in the event that they were a little too good at their job. But enough of that. Let's get back to the trivia at hand. Here was the question, how many cats are living at Disneyland? The answer, if you said 200 feline friends... You might just be cut out for a job taking care of the park cats. See ya! Uh, You should have said one, Tori. My my, my (laughs) cat-obsessed boyfriend is going to kill me. Anchoring for the win. I pulled everybody's (laughs) number up so much. We Mm. gave it it to you on a silver platter, Tori. I was 27 (laughs) off. I wanted to get it right, and that's what I get. Hey, cry me, a, cry me a river, oh. Tori. I guessed 140 chips episodes, and it was 137. No <laughs> credit in this game. I'm not sure that Tori knows what chips is. <laughs> no, I know. It was the Dax Shepard remake from two years ago. Hey. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know the original. Which is actually pretty good. Exactly. Was it? All I things considered. It, it, like, bombed at the box office. But, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, it's the Dax Shepard movie. It's going to not do well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was disappointing. Sorry, Paula. Dex, I'm Shep- sorry. I know I let Paula down. That's really the that's the sad part. Paula, I let Paula her was down. worse is that you actually had the. You're like, I was thinking 65. I know. <laughs> you know, all you had to say was 65. Go with your gut. Oh. That'll learn you. I'm smart, everybody. I promise. Next time you come on here, you'll know how to play the game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, I want to know if my theory is correct. How many acres is the Disneyland? Can you look that up real quick? Do you not have Google where you live? <laughs> Does Google reach the bunker? What's, what's that? <laughs> well, friends, but I, I feel idea? like you're on a computer right this moment, as a matter of fact. Why don't, All right, let me look it up. Why don't you do that, Len, while I say this? Let's take out the magnifying glass, everybody, and help somebody do better with their money, because today's hotline call comes to you courtesy of magnifymoney.com. When you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnifymoney, you know what you find there, Tori? You find those financial products that are at your bank, at that brick and mortar bank. They're not that good when you compare them to all the stuff online. In fact, over 92% of the products available online are all ranked head to head at Magnify Money. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnifymoney for more. And today... We're going to help our friend Demetrius magnify his money. Say hi, Demetrius. Hey, Joe and OG. My name's Demetrius. I graduated just over a year now with $3,000 in credit card debt and $8,000 in student loans. Now, thanks to some very small dinners and some 60-hour work weeks, I was able to clear that credit card debt in the last three months. The only problem is I work in manufacturing. 60 hours a week for me involves a lot of heavy lifting. 
I've got a chemistry degree, and I was wondering if you might be able to recommend any side hustles, seeing as you have this fancy blog and podcast and all. Anyways, thanks for your advice. I'm sure I'll learn nothing and say hi to neighbor Doug for me. I know he runs that place. As far as he knows, Demetrius, he does run that place, and we like to keep his head swelled so we can pay him less. That's that's the deal there. <laughs> Tori, Tori's like, that is so wrong. Equal pay. <laughs> equal, equal, not for Doug, though. Sure. I mean, that's a, that, that's, a, that's a whole different thing. But, Tori, let's start with you. Nice job by Demetrius at a young age, paying off yeah. a bunch of debt. That's, that's awfully cool. Also, his voice is lovely. He's a very lovely voice. Yeah, I mean, paying off a bunch of debt, working really hard, putting in those 60-hour work weeks. I mean, the thing with side hustling that you have to think through is really the number one priority is taking care of yourself before you even start a side hustle, making sure that you're able to give your full energy still to your nine-to-five job as well as a side hustle. And then my advice, because I I do the same thing, I nine-to-five, I side hustle, is figuring out, okay, there's two kinds of side hustles. There's one that's just kind of okay, I, I love doing this. This is a passion project of mine, but I'm not really interested in making money. And the second one is I want to make money, which it sounds like is the motivation for him. So find what skills you have or what you're passionate about that you can monetize. And maybe that's something you studied in college. Maybe it is some skill you have that is easily transferable online that you can take anywhere you go, but figure out, okay, what am I, what am I passionate about? What can I know? Or what do I know I'm good at that can make me money? and start building a business from there. Len, would you recommend that he go into uh, blog building? You you side hustled the lempezo.com blog in your spare time. Yeah, that's kind of slow though. I mean, it doesn't necessarily uh, pick up instant money. You know, that takes a while. But, you know, Demetrius, he sounds so cool. I mean, I'm listening to the guy, cool cat. He's got a degree in chemistry. I would, first off, Demetrius, you're working 60 hours a week. I don't know where you have time for a side hustle. But that being said, why don't you consider tutoring? Chemistry is not an easy subject and either tutoring high school kids or tutoring college kids. I think that would be a great way to uh, make a little extra money. Yeah, I like your caution, though, to go back to also what Tori said, taking care of yourself first. We've seen too many people, and even in our financial community, that faded really quickly because they got all excited. They put in a ton of time and then it, their health went out the window. So watch out for that. OG, what do you think? I think you also have to recognize that with anything, it's called a side business. So your expectations shouldn't be anywhere near the same level of income and that sort of stuff, especially early on. And if you're doing something for the long game, like God forbid blogging or podcasting, you know, I mean, it's a really long time before you have any fruits of your labor. If you're looking for a money thing, the first thing that came to mind when I heard that he was a chemist was, or a chemistry degree was, have you not seen any Breaking Bad episodes? <laughs> That's exactly what I would do. I like, the, I like the look on Tori's face. Pollo <laughs> Loco. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, you don't have to wait until you get cancer. You can just oh, do geez. it now. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> it's a great show. If you never RV, saw it. Commit a yeah. felony. It's yeah. fine. Several felonies. Just do them yeah, all yeah. at the same time. Direct your hate no, mail to OG at... Uh, People are hating me over Breaking Bad. I will say the that, greatest series that is of all the, time. the greatest series of all time. Hands billions down. billions Hands is pretty, down. pretty good, just so you know. But, but it's uh, the highest rated television show to ever air on United States television. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. it's crazy. I do like the school angle. I have a client who's got a background in chemistry and he's actually a PhD chemist. So I don't know if he's, if, if, if you've got that uh, far into your schooling, but uh, not only is there the opportunity for tutoring, but I bet you there's probably, if you have any advanced degree at all in it, uh, there's an opportunity for educating as well. So community college might be an option where you get to pick your own schedule a little bit in terms of teaching. And if you've got a uh, more advanced degree, a PhD or something, I'm certain that there's probably places where you can adjunct depending on where you live. So that would, that's the only thing I can add to that uh, relative to the work that you're doing already. Uh, my, you're a young guy. So 60 hour work weeks, man, just suck it up, buttercup, <laughs> make it happen. <laughs> My my spouse, Demetrius, works in the healthcare field, and I think there also might be some testing side hustles you might be able to do. In other words, working... Blood? What's that? Plasma? 
So like giving blood and plasma? <laughs> Not giving plasma. <laughs> so no. Diminishing I'm, return there pretty quickly. Talk about chemistry being a part-time chemist, you know, coming in and picking up the slack for some of these testing companies. I don't oh, know. Okay. I thought you mean like you're the guinea pig. Like, sure. Yes. Try, try that on me. See what happens. Turn my arm purple. Now what do I do? Just when he needs the next day at a 60-hour job, right? <laughs> coming in, can't lift his arms because he's now, the... Uh, now my back hurts. Right. What does that mean? Right, because he's trying out some new drug. No, not that at all. But I think that those are some great ideas, guys. Thanks for the question, Demetrius. Uh, by the way, congratulations on paying off all that debt in a short time. That That's is amazing. Yeah. 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 Nice job. That's fantastic. If you've got a question for the show, head to stackybenjamins.com and you'll see at the top of the page how to interface with the show. Click that link, questions for the show, and you'll see all the ways that uh, you can be like Demetrius. That's going to do it for today, kids. What a fun time. This was a blast. Let's have our guest go last. We'll have the drum roll build up to what's going on there. But let's start, Len, with you. Since last week you complained that you always have to go after Paula. <laughs> Paula, Paula Tori is always like, uh, I have a cure for cancer this week on my show. And I've got. Yeah. And Len's like, I'm doing a piece on whether butterscotch ice cream is worth it. <laughs> yeah, it always happens. Just, uh, and last week was especially egregious. Paula had all these fantastic uh, guests, and then you know I have to talk about you know something uh, you know eight stupid ways to uh, you know I don't know whatever. But uh, yeah, so thank you, Joe, for letting me go first, absolutely, and not uh, having to embarrass myself this week because I've got another stupid uh, uh, thing up. <laughs> so I was drinking some half and half. I put in some half and half on my coffee a while back, and I looked. And I noticed that the half and half, and I'd been drinking it for a long time. I noticed that the half and half was 34 days past the expiration date, but it still tasted great. So that got me to do a little research, and I found out some interesting things about expiration dates and uh, – is it really okay to eat certain foods past their expiration dates? And uh, a little teaser is yes, but it depends. Not so come on slide. by uh, lenpenzo.com and you can get all the dirty details. And because of that, now you will find Len hanging out by the Kroger dumpster every, <laughs> every Thursday. Or seated on the toilet. <laughs> One or the other. That's, that's Joe's story with eating coleslaw. <laughs> <laughs> past its yeah. expiration date. Yeah, that was not good. But it was delicious. <laughs> it was. At the time, it was. It hit the spot. That mayonnaise, that mayonnaise will get you. The next two mm -hmm. days were horrible. Who knew, who knew, Tori, that coleslaw sitting out for eight hours would be bad? What? what? I know, right? Unhealthy. Yeah, Don't weird. OG, what do you got uh, coming up? You probably, Len, already put this in your show or in your uh, blog, but uh, there's a great website called stilltasty.com. Yeah. And we have used that repeatedly, like sour cream yep. expiration. Oh, it says I, you I, can I, use it like a month and a half later. Like, all right. It's a good good place to go. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so this weekend is my oldest son's birthday. So we are um, going to celebrate by me golfing in a golf tournament. <laughs> <laughs> and by making your house bigger to get away from him. Boy, you're parent of the century. <laughs> exactly. Right and then I've got the developers coming over to add an extra wing to my... <laughs> It's no. the putting green. It's we are, so uh, bad. I, yeah, there's no room for the putting green once I put the pool in. Um, <laughs> My dad has a floating putting green, and you chip on the side of the pool, and you... Oh, yeah. oh that's Ooh. cool. Uh -oh. Now, you know, it's on my birthday list. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it's um, a little quiet period here. Definitely going to play a little golf this weekend. Yeah, it's nice, nice weather. It's my oldest son's birthday. And uh, we're going to celebrate actually next weekend because the party he wants to have requires a little bit more planning than a week. That's awesome. Happy birthday, oldest OG kid. Mm -hmm. He's so. a cool kid, too. Really cool kid. Nah, uh, he's he's getting a little mouthy. <laughs> oh, has he been? Yeah. Yeah, he's got See, a little... See, I don't, I don't expect that out of him. I expect yeah. it out of your middle kid. Yeah. Your middle kid's yeah, more no, like he's you. He's 12, right? He's 12 going on 16. So oh, he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. He's he's acting out a little kicking bit. Kicking in. He's there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Welcome. Welcome. Tori, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. You always have so much fun stuff going on. What's happening at her first 100K? 
Oh man, I actually was on a shoot all this weekend. I had a documentary film company fly out to shoot me and my story. They're, really? Uh, they're called yeah, they're called Sixty Second Docs, and so uh, they were in town this past weekend shooting me running around the city doing bar classes, which is like I you don't want to shoot me sweaty, but go ahead. And then interviewing about me and the mission of my company and organization. So yeah, it was a really, really fantastic opportunity. And then uh, I'm off to Leavenworth this coming weekend, which is a Bavarian village about two hours outside of Seattle. So I'm gonna, gonna eat say, some bratwurst. That that's that's I'm what I say, thought too. That's a, no. that's like, we like, immediately like, like, the time <laughs> served. <laughs> like now you just gotta start the clock for the two year Sentence? No, no I was, I'm very excited. I was about to very say. Excited. I was about to say, Steve, you got to cut this whole episode. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they finally caught up with me. That's why I wore yeah. orange to the show. Here. I'm, I'm going down. Run. Yep, I'm, I'm go going down. Some uh, some gingerbread and uh, stuff my face with some gingerbread, and then yeah, her first hundred k is going swimmingly. So I just. I love love building the brand and love connecting with new women and just so thankful that y'all had me on today. So thank you very much. Well, it's awesome what you're doing. And uh, we'll link to her first 100K on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com for people walking the dog or on their commute. That's going to do it. Uh, Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what did we learn today? First, take some advice from Tori and our roundtable. Focus less on clipping coupons and more on minimizing your huge costs like housing. By knowing your priorities and spending less money where others spend tons, you could become a super saver yourself. Second, struggling with a financial concept? Find a board game? Just like people hoping to know more about financial statements should play Jared's new Easy Profits game, maybe you should gamify whatever it is you're struggling to learn. But the big lesson... Here on National Hairball Day, we're excited. Uh, I got. <coughs> oh, oh, that's gross. Special thanks to Tori Dunlap for hanging out with us today. You'll find Tori at herfirst100k.com. Thanks also to Jared Sessler for stopping by. Find his Easy Profits game at easyprofitsgame.com and. Watch for the Kickstarter campaign coming soon. And special thanks to Len Penzo from LenPenzo.com. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I just jumped the shark. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. The people responsible for this show have been sacked. Welcome to the after show. Tori, this is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What happens here stays here, just so you know. We don't, we don't talk about this. Somebody the other day on, on Twitter uh, spoke about a segment that we had. Uh, Phil, I know Phil listens to us while he's running. I'm going to try to make Phil stop running here for a second. Stop it, Phil. You've got you to stop bringing up after show material, or uh, we have to have a talk. Uh, this piece came to us by way of our friend Lacey Langford, who is so funny. She referenced it on her social media page. This was on Fox News. Chaos at the Walmart 
As woman performs karate, son exposes himself, dog steals food, police say. Isn't that just your average day at, at a Walmart? Uh, chaos descends on a Wisconsin Walmart store Wednesday night. Uh, descended on a Wisconsin Walmart store Wednesday night after a karate performing mother, her naked son, and their belligerent dog shoplifted and ran amok in the store. The Eau Claire, it's, is, is that an Eau Claire? Eau Claire? I would say, yeah. The Eau Claire Police Department said on social media that the officers responded to a call that a woman, Lisa Smith, 46, and her dog, Bo, shoplifted items from the store. The woman's son, 26-year-old Benny Van, was causing chaos in the store as well. Police learned Smith came into the shop with Bo unleashed, with the dog immediately running off toward customers while the woman was pulling apart displays in the store and placing them in her cart. After being told to leave the store, the woman began showing off her karate moves in the parking lot to fend off police officers. <laughs> the dog tried to flee the crime scene, albeit unsuccessfully, with a box of Jiffy cornbread muffin mix in his mouth. After a brief fight with the officer, Smith was arrested. As a last-ditch attempt, she tried to kick a window out of the police car. Her raucous son, meanwhile, was getting fully naked and began exposing himself to other customers at the store. He then tried to cover himself with new clothes from the store without intending to pay for them, police said. Well, not sure what's wrong with any of that, Len. I don't either. I mean, holy smokes. I can't believe, they, I can't believe they called you Benny in this piece, Len. <laughs> That's a, hey, speaking of expiration days, do you see the picture of that lady? She's 46 years old. She looks like she's uh, yeah. way past her expiration date. Yeah, yeah. No, um, no, uh, um, <laughs> n- no judgment, but, okay. but. <laughs> But 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 yes. Stay in school. <laughs> but stay in school. Yes. Uh, and off meth, probably. Yeah. Yeah, she has a black eye or two in this picture. Not not looking her best. We have all seen some. I thought this would be a good jumping off point for a fun discussion. We've all seen some crazy stuff happen that you're not not sure what the heck's going on, or maybe there's been weird stuff that's happened around you in your town. Whatever. Thought maybe we could talk about some of this stuff. Tori, any wild and crazy. Seattle things you're out someplace and somebody just does something completely off the wall. We have a pretty big homeless population in Seattle. We have a lot of people who are unsheltered here. And so, yeah, there's certain, there's certain crazy things that they'll do. Um, I always feel bad. I mean, I feel really bad. Maybe I should feel bad for these people, but I always feel bad because there's so much mental illness there in the homeless community. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the first thing I thought of when I read that headline was, Oh, this has got to be in Florida. And then it wasn't in Florida. It was Wisconsin. So it was shocking. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything crazy. I'm sure there is, but nothing's coming to me right now. But yeah, I mean, I used to work retail. That was like my summer job. And so I was the person in charge of stopping a lot of these shoplifters. So that's a whole other thing. Well, but you must add some brazen attempts to shoplift. Me? No, people at your store. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Me never. Did, did you learn I all will the best? Never describe those attempts. No. Yeah. Um, I worked at a hardware store, so the amount of weird things that people would try to steal, like wire that was really, really expensive, and they just shove it up the front of their shirts and just like try to walk out with it. Yeah. That's not it a was, chainsaw. What are you talking about? Yeah, literally. <laughs> I. I was on your pants. You're just happy to see me. Well, yeah, I remember Gary Shandling. I used to love Gary Shandling's comedy, and was so sad when he passed away. <laughs> One of his favorite bits was about they'd open up those Holly Farms sausage places in the mall around the holidays. And he and his friend would go in and they'd steal summer sausage by stick them in their pants. And as he'd walk out, they'd say, is that summer sausage in your pants? And he'd turn around and go, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> thank, I appreciate it. Nice compliment. Uh, oh, gee, you got to have you grew up in a little redneck town like I did. Come on. A redneck town. I wouldn't call it the town I grew up in. No a redneck town, but. Um, then I won. Yes. <laughs> Trust me. That's not a competition that you <laughs> want to win. No, I remember when I was a kid. So I had just started driving for some reason. We had this just habit of always getting into car chases. And by we, I mean me driving. And then whoever I was with would always do something that precipitated somebody chasing us. And they were always, you know, I'm 16. These are 22 year olds. Ch- you know what I mean? Like that kind of nonsense. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sitting at a stoplight and I look over at my buddy who rolls down the window. He's sitting in the passenger side at the car next to us. It sticks both hands out the window and just double birds them both. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? So then the guy gets out and he starts 
you know, walking toward the car. And so we take off and, um, we're, I mean, it's two in the morning and we're ripping through these city streets at God knows what. Finally, I come around this corner. Here's a police officer. I'm like, great. Now I go to jail. This is how I, my dad knew it was happening. He just didn't know it was going to be when I was 16, you know? And, uh, so the cop whips out, woo, comes up behind me. I pull over right away. And he comes run up to the window like, what is wrong with you? What are you doing? I said, you know, and I play my full on like, I'm sorry, officer, but the, there's a, older people chasing me and I'm scared and I don't know what to do. And just then here comes this car whipping around the oh, car. For thank like, God. like it was perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> like fishtailing across the parking lot. And I go, that's them. And he goes, stay here. And I went, okay. And he takes off and they, now they're getting chased by the cops. And I just turned around and went back to my house and you're gone. <laughs> and that was that. But I've seen a lot of crazy stuff on uh, like airplanes, like just gross things. Yeah. Like, uh, like the, feet. uh, the stuff when we had Betty on from Betty in the sky with a suitcase. Yeah. Like clipping their nails. I saw one person, the person sat next to me had their little dog, which I have an issue with people traveling with animals anyway, but they have their dog. They literally put the tray table down and put their dog on the tray table. And I just looked at her and I said, do you think that that's the right place for your dog at this moment? Like out of all the places that you could have your puppy, I get it, you know, part of the family and that sort of thing. And that's fine. But the next person who's going to sit here is going to have a meal on that table and And your dog's licking it. And they're not going to be wiping it down. Yeah. But you know, we do in our when we travel, but feet and ugh, all kind of nastiness. Len, you know what? I I've seen my shoplifters in my day. I've seen a streaker at a baseball game. I've seen uh, uh, one time I was driving down the road and some guy I don't know what he was, he was trying to hop a fence, one of those those wrought iron fences with kind of like the spiky, yeah. um, you know, oh, and didn't he work. Did, his shirt got caught, so he was hanging. Oh. So he was hanging and he was all alone. And I just drove right by and just let him keep hanging there. So now this was this was before the days of cell phones. It's not like, hey, get on the cell phone. Hey, this guy needs some help or, or whatever. I mean, it was a tall fence. This was like a, a you were headed foot. to the nearest. You need, the they nearest needed, police needed a ladder to, to get this guy yeah, off. Yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, but it was kind of funny. Seen him there. I mean, he wasn't in danger or anything like that. But He's he was just like, <laughs> They're just going to find him the next morning. Yeah. Just hanging out. I had one that I didn't see myself, but uh, made the national news, which is in, in my little redneck hometown, there's a little community bank and these uh, these bank robbers came in through the uh, through <laughs> came in through the drive through and they you know, you get the little shoot to the drive through and they put in the little container. Uh, Give us all your money. We have guns. And they showed the person the like that they put the thing back in and uh went through the shoot and the and the uh the bank teller reads it looks out at them and they show her their guns that they're serious and uh the the bank teller pretended like she was first of all she has bulletproof glass number 2 is she has a little button just below the uh, counter she presses the button and then she pretends that she makes sure her hands are high and she just continues to pretend like she's stacking money well she is stacking money she just keeps stacking money and stacking money and stacking money until you might say she's stacking benjamin she's stacking ben nice job <laughs> good work <laughs> she's got it uh until there's cops on both sides of them like dumbest criminals ever that's in my hometown we're very proud of them 